So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tenement Museum. My name is Laura Lee, and I manage the Tenement Talk series here. It's great to see you all out this evening, our, uh, first talk of the spring. Um, and I'm really excited uh, to be able to work with the Marshall Project uh, and screen part of uh, a documentary film series that they produced this past year, um, which is called We Are Witnesses, Becoming an American. Um, it really does shine a light on the diverse experiences of what it means to be an immigrant in this country. Um, and when they initially reached out to us and um, kind of approached us about working with them to have a public program around this, this film, um, it was kind of an easy yes for us. Uh, at the Tenement Museum, it's really our mission to think about ways to kind of cultivate a, a culture that is um, welcoming uh, and values the experience of immigrants and their kind of evolving um, marks on the identity of what it means to be American. And so this film is really just another way that we see that those stories being told and highlighted. And so it really, for us, makes sense to be able to um, offer a platform here at the museum. Um, so what we're gonna do tonight, uh, we'll start by sharing just a portion of the entire series. There are 12 short films in total. We're gonna show four of them tonight. Um, and then we have an esteemed panel who will come up to the front and talk about um, what, what has happened and then we'll give you all an opportunity to join in the conversation with your questions and comments as well. Um, so this film um, at the museum, we talk a lot about the past and present. It's really important for us to kind of have this historical context and think about what's happened in the past, what's happening now, where are we headed. Um, this film is decidedly contemporary in its conversation, um, but we're still gonna be thinking about um, the historical context and what has come before and how sometimes Sometimes these stories are quite parallel um, from present to what was happening in the past. So we'll be able to cover all that ground this evening. Um, so without further ado, We Are Witnesses, Becoming an American uh, takes a deeper look at asylum seekers, advocates, immigration and custom enforcement officers, the documented and the undocumented. The series offers a 21st century narrative of American immigration that depicts the struggle and humanity of its participants. Hi, Dad. Muy bien, puedes venir al asiento. Can you come? Okay. Quédate ahí. Tranquilo, está bien ahí. Tranquilo, no te preocupes. You're looking good. Don't worry. This is the Ecuadorian George Clooney. My name is Danny Biasis. I am 22 years old. I have my dad, my mom, and my twin sister. My name is Leon Andrea Biasis. I was born in Colombia, Pasto, and I've been living most of my life since I was five here in New York. My name is Liani Guerrero. I am from Colombia. My husband is from Ecuador. I saw one in Ecuador when I was in the college. Later, we married and moved to Colombia. In Colombia was too many travel for the security. My father was kidnapped, my family, all my family was involved in politic things. There were threats made against my mom and my sister and I specifically. There were pictures of us taken in a playground, sent to my parents as threats. My parents ultimately decided that the best thing to do would be to leave. We moved with our family to try to find asylum. We applied for political asylum, but didn't work. We tried to appeal every time. I always assumed like, okay, we're trying. We're doing everything we can. I know my parents are paying lawyers. So I knew that they were trying. It just turns out it wasn't that easy. We found the stay of removal for six years. We check in with ICE every year. But at the same time, we found our permit, driver license, social security. We live very well. My husband, he works very hard. He was a physical therapist. We try to educate our daughters the best. Of the best. 
we've lived all of our life here. Since I was five years old, you know, every morning we would pledge the flag. We're very Americanized, as my dad said, you know, Thanksgiving, all of these traditional American um, customs. We have incorporated them into our own culture and into our own lives. As soon as Donald Trump was elected, I knew that life was changing, and I just really did not think it was going to be this much changes. We would all go to the ICE check-ins um, together most of the years, and especially this year because we knew that things could go wrong. They called a Juana, and we went to, with him, and the officer said, no, you continue sit down here, and Juan coming along with the lawyer. The lawyer came to me maybe a few minutes later and say, Juan is in detention. Both of the stay of removals had been denied for my dad and for my mom. Technically, that day, they were supposed to be deporting both my mom and my dad. But because my mom has some medical issues, she is being given two more months. I say, oh my god, this is impossible. We try to, to speak with everybody and say, my husband, he is a very good man with very good moral and spiritual principles. I can understand the situation. Our lawyer said, can he hug his kids and wife who are outside? He said, no, we don't offer that courtesy anymore. We don't want um, showing of emotion. The next time I saw him was at the detention center in New Jersey. The minute that he comes out, you know, with his like orange shirt and his vans, you could see it that he's just, you know, he's completely broken. Um, and, you know, we've always been a family that we laugh around and, you know, we joke around. Um, and I was like, we have to do that because we cannot cry in front of him. Um, we have each other right now and, and dad's like really by himself and we can't like break down in front of him. You know, there's a, the glass window is very, it's like a movie, but you can't believe that you're in it and this is real. What really killed me was kind of like the very end when he kind of like, he's like, he put his hand on the glass and he's like, just put your hand on it. And I was like, oh man, <laughs> my dad, don't do this. <laughs> um, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to know that he's sort of like on that other side. And uh, now to look at it, that was kind of like the last moment that we kind of had before he was deported. Um, he was deported in December 8th to Guayaquil, Ecuador. They brought us here for us to have a better life. And right now, you know, I feel like I'm doing well. You know, I'm like working in the job that I've like dreamt of working in. My sister's graduating. Um, you know, they built all of this for us. And now they have to go. What are you going to do today? Uh, work out. That's it? What else? No, nothing, uh, nothing exciting, I guess. Right. The usual. I'm going to walk now, walk down. It's about uh, three or four blocks. And then uh, this neighbor is new to me, and so I was uh, new to walking. When the time I was walking, I was wondering, OK, here is a, a nice restaurant. Now it's a grocery, and then uh, shopping, whatever. So. I know where I'm going now to, to, to take my heart cut, my love. All right, Dad, so we'll talk to you later, OK? OK, my love. I love you. Bye, Dad. Love you. Bye, love. I'm a fairly new attorney. It's actually a second career for me. I used to be a journalist. <laughs> I was reporting a story about immigration detention facilities in Louisiana. And the experience of sitting in a courtroom was so jarring for me that that convinced me that it wasn't enough to be a neutral observer. I'm Lee Wong. I am an attorney at the Immigrant Defense Project in New York City. current heated debate about immigration, there's a lot of focus on what's happening at the border. But actually, the, the biggest increases that we're seeing in immigration enforcement are happening in the interior. A lot of the calls that we get are from longtime green card holders, people who came here as babies. 
the immigration system can take someone who has spent their entire life in the United States, maybe made one mistake, paid for it, served their time, and then years later can drag them into the deportation system and essentially separate them from their families forever. A lot of what we're seeing today is in part a result of a confluence of events. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. In 1996, Congress passed a pair of laws under the Clinton administration, and that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize. This administration has taken a strong stand to stiffen the protection of our borders. Those two laws intertwined the criminal justice systems and immigration in a way that we had never seen before. They added dozens of new categories of crimes that could get someone deported. All of a sudden, a conviction for something such as theft could subject you to mandatory deportation. But that legal architecture wasn't really used until after 9-11, when there is obviously a lot of concern about national security. The border should be open to trade and lawful immigration and shut to illegal immigrants, as well as criminals, drug dealers, and terrorists. The Department of Homeland Security was created, and ICE was a part of that. ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and ICE was given the ability to access our criminal justice databases. They literally, you know, can generate lists and lists of people with old criminal convictions and just systematically go after them. Tonight, I'd like to talk with you about immigration. The Obama administration politicized immigration just in the same way that every administration really does. And they made a gamble. Today, our immigration system is broken. Their gamble was essentially if we can show that we are quote unquote tough on immigration and deport two million people, which is what he did, maybe we'll get the trade off that we want. Even as we are a nation of immigrants, we're also a nation of laws. That gamble did not work. It didn't pay off. And as a result, millions of families were separated. That being said, you know, the Obama administration did not go after anyone and everyone. What's happened under the Trump administration is the law is what the law is, and the Trump administration is going to enforce it to the fullest extent possible. Countless Americans who have died in recent years would be alive today if not for the open border policies of this administration. And he is using this broad brush to dehumanize immigrants and just make it easier to get rid of them. There are 11 million undocumented people in the United States. The idea that we're going to deport all of them is absurd. Yet the Trump administration's commitment is to engage in mass deportation. And we're already seeing the results of that. It's not just rhetoric. What is this era going to mean for future generations? The human consequences are so immense. I don't even think that we have kind of begun to fathom um, what it all really means. I had a chance to help a lot of good people enter the United States. I used to think of it as building America one case at a time. My name is Paul Wickham Schmidt, and I served as a United States immigration judge from 2003 till my retirement in June 2016. An asylum case, this judge isn't supposed to be looking for ways to say no. It's supposed to be looking to see if these people can be protected. I'd say almost everybody that came before me in court, they all were making contributions. They were working hard. They were raising their families. And the first thing you usually have to decide is whether the testimony is credible or not. Then you decide whether that fact situation uh, fits within any of the categories of people uh, that can stay. It's a human decision. That's what refugee law is really supposed to be. That obviously is a difficult time when you have to tell somebody that they're going to have to return, even though you probably believe that they're going to be in trouble when they go back. 
there's no doubt about the fact that I that I've made mistakes, and I, I probably have uh, sent some people home that I uh, that I should have allowed to stay, and I've probably uh, uh, allowed some people to stay that maybe weren't telling me the whole truth, but I couldn't figure it out. I liked swearing in. It, it was one of the fun parts of, uh, of the job. Most immigrants here are law-abiding individuals who just want pretty much the same things we all do. A stable place to live, uh, uh, a future for their children, and a chance to uh, use their skills in an environment where uh, they're not in fear all the time. Immigrants have built this country, made huge contributions. Pounding drywall, building houses, fixing bridges, fixing cars, helping hotels, taking care of children. You know, the things that really make America, America. <laughs> I believe in this great country of ours that you don't just become part of the fabric, you are actually tested. Here is freedom, but are you willing to fight to be part of it? My name is Zaid Nagy. I was born in uh, the city of Eb, the Republic of Yemen. I was 13 years old. My dad brought me. He was a U.S. citizen, so he was able to uh, bring us in. It's the next step following the dream, so creating the road for a dignified life, I guess. Most Yemeni Americans, like my dad, own uh, grocery stores. The stores are open 24 hours. Greeting people in the morning when they're grouchy, and facing them when they come at five o'clock, when they're tired, that's not an easy job. You know, open up your door to everybody. I mean, everybody, from the criminal to the angel. Anybody who looks at history uh, will see that's the first job that an immigrant, you know, that's the unwanted job. This is the, the, the harsh job. 9-11, I was behind the counter working in my uncle's store. I didn't understand what's going on. Before 9-11, you were just like the next American. After that, oh, you're a terrorist, you know, you will be serving somebody in a grocery store, and then you just have a minor argument that had to do with nothing. Very soon, he just put the big word on you, you know, or sand niggers or camel jackies and words like that. It's become a question. Uh, are we really part of the fabric? These are radical Islamic terrorists. And she won't even mention the word, and nor will President Obama. He won't I was following the election very close. When the election was going on, I was telling, that's not gonna be allowed here. That's what I was telling my friends and friend of Rana. These things might be allowed in Yemen, but this is not gonna be allowed in America. And then when the election occurred, okay, maybe he, he won, but still, the, he's just, one part of the system. And then we got hit with a travel ban. A picture was painted of our community. Travel ban said, these are bad people, terrorists. My community say, no, 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 no. That's not who we are. We are business owners. We are people who work 12 hours. We are the people who are serving you the coffee in the morning. We are the people who, who make you sandwich. And here we are. February 2nd, more than a thousand Yemeni American store in the city of New York closed. And 6,000 Yemeni Americans I had a protest at Brooklyn Bar Hall. And I was in the heart of it. That was a very important moment in my life. That was a very important moment in our community existent in the United States. This community that comes from a country where showing up 
really has serious consequences, it did show up. There is a saying in Arabic that says, nafa, which means sometimes bad things is good for you. The Yemeni American community, we were dormant. We actually run away from politics. We kind of like rely on the other forces to always fight for us until uh, one day we are forced to stand up. I'm a firm believer still to this day and to this moment of the American way. I hope I, I'm not wrong uh, that despite anything, at the end of it, uh, at the end of it, America will get it right. Um, those very personal stories are incredibly powerful, and I'm looking forward to being able to dig in them, uh, into them a little deeper. I want to invite our panelists to come up and have a seat, and I, I want to introduce all of them to you. Um, so first, sure, uh, our, our first uh, panelist is Carol Bogart. Um, she is the president of the Marshall Project, a nonprofit media outlet covering criminal justice issues. The Marshall Project seeks to create and sustain a sense of national urgency about the criminal justice system, producing journalism that helps make the system more fair, effective, transparent, and humane. It is the youngest uh, organization ever to win a Pulitzer Prize. Carol previously spent 18 years as a deputy director of the Human Rights Watch, and uh, she was also a, co a foreign correspondent for Newsweek magazine based in Moscow, Hong Kong, and Beijing, covering the fall of the Soviet Union, the Tiananmen Square protest, and the economic rise of Asia. She holds an MA in East Asian Studies and a BA uh, magna cum laude from Harvard University and has two grown daughters. Carol will be moderating our conversation this evening. Um, next is uh, Liani Viasis. Uh, she is a Colombian citizen who moved to New York with her family at the age of five seeking political asylum. Liani and her sister are both DACA recipients and this has enabled them to get a bachelor's degree in Baruch College and work in their professions. In November 2017, their lives changed when their father was detained at a routine check-in uh, with ICE leading to his deportation in Ecuador, December 2017. Liani's mother is awaiting a decision from a higher court to determine whether or not she will be able to continue her life in America. Welcome, Liani. Um, next, we have uh, Marie Mark. Marie is a supervising attorney at the Immigrant Defense Project, a nonprofit organization fighting for fairness and justice for all immigrants, with a focus on people who have been arrested or convicted of crimes. She leads a team um, advising immigrants, their loved ones, and attorneys about the immigration consequences of contacts with the criminal legal system and building capacity of legal services providers to work with people who have been arrested. Marie came to IDP after five years of practice at a public defender office as an immigration attorney. She received her law degree from New York University School of Law, where she participated in the Children's Rights Clinic and the Immigrant Rights Clinic. Marie holds an undergraduate degree from Swarthmore College. And then we have Jenny Karchman, who created this film series. She's the filmmaker. Um, Jenny is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Most recently, she produced and directed Showtime's original series, The Fourth Estate, which follows the New York Times reporters covering the first year of Donald Trump's presidency. The series was nominated for a 2018 Emmy for Outstanding Documentary for Nonfiction Series, in addition to many other awards. Jenny also produced and directed award-winning series, We Are Witnesses, for The Marshall Project and The New Yorker. She has produced several documentaries and special projects for the Academy Award-winning director, Martin Scorsese. And Jenny is also on the advisory council of the Ghetto Film School, a nonprofit which teaches filmmaking to high school students based in the Bronx, New York. 
Um, so these um, panelists are going to have a conversation about uh, this film series and what you all just saw. Um, before they do, though, I would like to invite uh, someone from one of our partner institutions, Ellis Island, um, to come up and just kind of um, make a historical comment on the films that are very, very contemporary. So I'm going to ask Danelle uh, Simonelli, who is a park ranger uh, with the National Park Service at Ellis Island National Museum of Immigration and part of the Statue of Liberty National Monument to come up. She's presented public tours and educational programs at Ellis Island for 22 years. And she's also been a ranger at Morristown National Historic Park, a New Jersey historic site from the American Revolution. A native New Yorker now living in New Jersey, Danelle graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Vassar College and earned a master's degree in international relations from Georgetown University. So Danelle. Thank you. So I'd just like to provide some historical context and, and talk about how what's happening today, as exemplified in part by the, the video, how does that compare to what the tenement buildings residents faced? So there are both similarities and differences. Uh, the immigration system in the United States was very different prior to the 1920s. There were no quotas limiting how many people could immigrate. There were no visas that would clear you in advance to immigrate. You make the trip and then find out when you arrive at a port of entry whether the United States will let you in. Before 1855, you basically just walked off the boat. In 1855, individual states, such as New York State, start inspecting immigrants. And in 1890, the federal government takes over the inspections and opens Ellis Island as the biggest immigration station in 1892. So the purpose of the inspection is to determine whether you would be a danger or a burden to the United States. So there's a medical exam and there's a legal interview. So you could be denied entry if, for example, you have an incurable disease or disability that's either dangerous to other people or would keep you from earning a living. You could be denied if you're judged unable to support yourself financially, if you have a serious criminal background, if you're an anarchist or a communist, if you're guilty of moral turpitude, of bad moral character, for example, if you're a prostitute or a polygamist. And this might be a surprise, you could be denied entry if you already have a job lined up in the United States. That was illegal in most cases in Ellis Island's day, so that's one key difference from today. Detention was a routine part of the process for about 20% of the immigrants in Ellis Island's day. So if they can't make an immediate decision to admit you, about 20% of the people have to stay at Ellis Island uh, until your, your entry is decided one way or the other. You know, usually detention in Ellis Island's day was very brief. It could be just overnight. Um, they wouldn't want to keep you for longer than about a month. They'd want to make a decision one way or the other. Uh, they'll give you a chance to recover. If you have a short-term illness, you'll stay in the Ellis Island Hospital. Uh, you might have to stay long enough for them to gather information to hold a hearing. If the hearing goes against you, you would be detained to allow you to appeal the process. Um, they might decide to deny you entry and then you'd be detained for a while until there was a ship available to take you back to the port you came from. Now, the few really long detentions in Ellis Island's day were for people who got stranded in the United States during wartime. For example, in World War I, uh, if a decision was made to deny you entry, but there were no ships traveling because of the submarine war in the Atlantic. There were a fair number of people who got stranded in the United States for this reason, um, and some of them continued to be detained by the federal government, but a lot of them were paroled. They developed a system of parole so that the federal government would not have to keep them detained, and they could go 
into the United States, but with the understanding they'd eventually have to go back. And another category of long detentions would be enemy aliens. So for example, German citizens who were in the United States when the US entered the war. Um, I was asked, was detention back then similar to being in prison? Um, I would say on, on the whole, no. Um, the vast majority of detainees were not considered criminals. They were just pe people waiting until they could be healed in the hospital or waiting for a decision to be made on their case as quickly as possible. Um, if they th thought you were an actual criminal or a national security threat, you could be kept under closer guard with bars on the windows, but Ellis Island, for the vast majority of detainees, was not like a prison. Um, definitely better conditions than prisons of the day. Um, your movements are limited, you can't leave the island, but you're living in a state-of-the-art hospital ward, or you're living in a dormitory, you're getting three free meals a day, getting free state-of-the-art medical care, access to recreation and religious services, and charity workers to help you, and you're quite possibly living in much better conditions than you might have been used to back in the old country. Now, on the other hand, the United States was worried about terrorism back then, and legitimately so. An anarchist, for example, assassinated the president of the United States, McKinley, in 1901. Anarchists were blowing up buildings on Wall Street. Communists overthrew the Russian government and murdered the Tsar. In World War I, German saboteurs were, were blowing things up in the United States. Uh, so there were national security concerns that in many ways parallel um, what we experience today. Uh, there were deportations in the past of immigrants who'd been allowed in but were later found to be a danger or a burden. For example, if you were an active anarchist uh, promoting bomb making, and there were people like that, they, they, when they were apprehended, they were deported. Um, shiploads full of communists were deported during the Red Scare following the Russian Revolution. Um, on, a, on a less dramatic note, if you became a public charge within five years, if you committed a crime of moral turpitude, uh, you could be deported. Um, you did always have a hearing before deportation, and you could appeal a negative decision up through several different levels all the way to the cabinet secretary of the department immigration was in, which actually changes over time. Uh, but like today, most immigration cases are handled as internal administrative procedures of the Immigration Bureau. They're not subject to a regular court of law. Uh, Another similarity between then and now is that immigrants have always faced discrimination on the part of a certain number of Americans. So whatever groups are coming in the greatest numbers, there tends to be a reaction against them. That might be Germans in the late 1700s, early 1800s. By the mid 1800s, it's the Chinese and the Irish. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, Ellis Island's era, it was Southern and Eastern Europeans that, that had the stigma. Uh, Italians like my grandparents who came through Ellis Island, Poles, East European Jews. And sometimes this reaction has been strong enough to make it into US law, like the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned virtually all Chinese immigration like the quotas in the 1920s that ended the Ellis Island era, which were specifically designed to restrict entry by the Southern and Eastern Europeans. So the ethnic and religious groups change over time, but the same sorts of accusations are made. For example, and I'll use the Italians as, as my heritage, all Italians are either gangsters, anarchists, terrorists, or just lazy good-for-nothings, and they can't be loyal Americans because they're Catholic. They'll take orders from the Pope. So if you change the ethnicity and the religion, it sounds very much like some of the things that are said about immigrants today. 
But so there are a lot of similarities between then and now. There are a couple key other key differences. Uh, until the 1920s, there was not a huge distinction between legal and illegal immigrants. They didn't use those terms. Uh, you were given no ID card equivalent to a green card to prove you'd entered lawfully. Since there were no limits on how many people could immigrate, it was not a big deal if you entered without being inspected or overstayed a short visit, if you were later discovered to be undocumented, if at that point you could pass inspection, you'd usually be allowed to stay. A famous example of that is the actor Bela Lugosi. Anybody remember him from the Dracula movies? Uh, he was a crew member on a ship who jumped ships to stay in the United States and later presented himself at Ellis Island acting, asking to be formally admitted. And they had a hearing and ruled he could stay. Uh, and lo and behold, he was immediately legal. It was not a big deal. One other difference is that before quotas, there was no need for any special procedures for refugees or asylum seekers. You just had to pass inspection the same as everybody else. Uh, you might need a sponsor if you didn't meet the financial requirements on your own, but otherwise there was no special treatment necessary for uh, refugees and asylum seekers. The concept of asylum didn't really exist at this point. So on the whole, I'd say there are probably more similarities than differences between immigration then and now. Uh, one thing I think I forgot to mention is that only 2% of those arriving at Ellis Island were ultimately denied entry. So the vast majority of people detained do get in at the end. Um, and I also wanted to mention, it is possible that one or more family members could be denied entry and the others allowed in. Um, you would have the option to all go back, um, or if one person is being deported after already being admitted, you could all decide to leave. But there are some sad stories of, of people, say even, an, an elderly grandparent uh, who was deemed likely to become a public charge because the person could not support themselves on their own. Uh, denied entry, insisting that the younger members of the family enter the United States. Granny goes back and they never hear from each other again. So there are sad stories along those lines. Um, uh, I'll leave it at that, and we can, we can talk more about similarities as, as you wish later. But so on the whole, more similarities than differences between immigration then and now. Many analysts see close parallels between US attitudes in the 1920s and today. So they're, they're both periods when the doors seem to be closing and often in a discriminatory way, often with nasty rhetoric directed against particular groups. I think you can look at these historical comparisons in one of two ways. You could say, well, there's precedent for what's going on today, deporting and denying entry to undesirables, and often defining what's undesirable on the basis of ethnic and religious discrimination. Or you could say, yes, there's precedent, but they were wrong about the Chinese and the Italians being threats to America, uh, so we shouldn't repeat policies from such an ugly episode in US history. So that's my historical perspective. Okay, thank you very much for that historical perspective. That was fascinating and I think don't we all feel a little bit like we have to watch our moral turpitude? That seems to be a <laughs> phrase that's repeating itself. I'm, I'm checking myself for moral turpitude. I'm not sure. 
It is something that we report on. The Marshall Project, we report on the criminal justice system, but we also do report on immigration. I should say that, as was mentioned in the film and as some people have experienced very directly, those two systems are beginning to become very uh, intimately intertwined in ways that they were not in the time of Ellis Island. So that would be one, one difference that we're certainly very aware of and ha that has led the Marshall Project to want to report on these systems. I want to start by asking Liani, because whenever I see Liani or her sister, Dani, who is also here today, the first thing I want to ask, and I assume that the audience wants to know this too, is how's your dad and what's happening with your mom? Well, mom, mom's here today. Um, is she here today? She's at the doctor. She might be getting here a little later, but she is, uh, <laughs> she's still here with us today. Um, we're waiting on a higher court to be able to make a determination uh, on our asylum case. Um, and actually, we're supposed to be waiting this month for a decision to come. So we're waiting that. Um, if the decision is positive, then my dad would ultimately come back uh, until the asylum gets finalized. Um, and if it is denied, then my mom would have a week to buy a, a flight uh, to go back to Colombia. Um, and then in regards to dad, uh, dad's in Ecuador right now. Um, he's been there for quite some time now. Um, we talk to him every single night just to be able to catch up, see how his day is going. Um, but just under the circumstances, I think, you know, he has his good days, he has his bad days where, you know, he's continuously watching the news here in the U.S. and he keeps on hearing all these stories and he quickly relates, um, you know, and whenever, when, whenever I personally take a flight, whether it's to just, you know, Work-related, I always think of how his position was when he was taking that deportation flight and knowing that he wouldn't be able to come back, like how his thoughts were around that. Um, but, you know, we're, we're waiting on, the, on a decision to be made right now, really, for Dad. Well, we're all waiting with you. Thank you. Um, Marie, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you're sort of here in Lee Wong's stead, as it were, uh, a colleague. And uh, maybe you can describe a little bit about what a typical day is like in your office, because I'm under the impression that it is rather frantically busy and that you have a lot of cases continually on your plate. How, how does it feel to be in that system? Yeah, so I, I'm not a great stand-in for Lee, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I work at the Immigrant Defense Project, and we one of my big positions is that we run a hotline that... Um, is open to anyone in the country, immigrants, their loved ones, their attorneys, who are all asking, what do I do about the fact that I have this arrest and I'm not a U.S. citizen, um, or the fact that my client has been arrested and they're not a U.S. citizen. And we, um, we record their stories, but we also provide legal advice. Um, and the most heartbreaking, and I think the stories that kind of send us into a, into a frantic pace in the office, um, have to do with the way that enforcement is happening specifically in New York City right now. And so what we see is that um, even though the city of New York has tried to make itself a sanctuary and tried to cut as many of the ties as it can with ICE, um, because of the infrastructure that has already been built up, when people are arrested, their fingerprints are automatically sent to immigration. And they're home address information is automatically sent to immigration, and sometimes their work address information is automatically sent. And immigration then uses that information to surveil people in their communities, so they will have watched someone for a week, maybe two weeks. And then at a moment when they believe that person is going to be the most vulnerable, which for most people is around 4 a.m., um, they come to their homes and they knock on the door and they say, police, right? And I think for most people, if it's four o'clock in the morning and the police are knocking on my door, I open the door, right? Um, and the police say, we need, we need to talk to you, right? Are you so-and-so, right? And they get an individual to say, yes, my name is Marie Mark. And they say, great, you're who we're looking for. We're immigration you're coming with us. And just like that horrible story you heard from Liani of people saying, okay, well, and that ended up being the last time that I saw my loved one before they were deported. Those are the calls we get in the aftermath of that. This was the last time I saw my loved one. What is going to happen? And so we describe then for them, you know, this administrative system that doesn't give people a lot of due process rights, that does leave people in real criminal detention centers, right? The Bergen County Jail is Bergen County in New Jersey's criminal jail system, the same way that we have Rikers here in New York. Um, and so we are explaining to people then, 
you know, what are your limited options? And that's, I think, the thing that makes us um, most frantic in the office. I can imagine. Jenny, can you talk a little bit about, um, in the making of this, these films, and it's a series of films, as you can see, you've watched a few of them, and there are how many altogether? It's 12 total. 12 total. So it's kind of, it's a real pastiche of different kinds of experiences that people have of the immigration system, and you saw some of that in this, you know, including an immigration judge, and there's a border patrol guy in this series, and sort of everybody who touches the system, and what, how do they think about it and experience it? You know, what, what kind of surprised you most as you were putting this together, and what did you find, what sort of people said things that made you say, boop, 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 boop? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, there were a couple things. First, um, I did not know how hard it is to become a citizen. I assumed that um, you, like, like any, like, for instance, um, Liani's family has been here for 15 years trying to get their citizenship, applying for political asylum. That process takes years and years and years and lawyers and stress and um, an enormous amount of burden on your sense of well-being and also your ability to put down roots and your ability to put your children in school. And it it's a process that I naively did not recognize how difficult it would actually be. Um, Liani's family is one example. We, we filmed with a boy who was 14 when he came by himself from Honduras and he came to, he went through Mexico, he arrived in San Diego and um, he's was told in Honduras you have to go and look for border patrol because they will take care of you essentially. They're gonna find, you know, house you and find you a place to go and he was ultimately united with an aunt who lived in New York and he is thriving and he's going he's in college on a scholarship and he's um, a a you know an example of just the hardship and the determination and the will and um, the the ways people are struggling but fighting to be here and how hard it is it's it's I think those of us who are born here or who are citizens take it for granted that um, you have all of these rights and and freedoms and abilities to move around um, at will but that's not true for everyone and it's certainly not true for people who are undocumented and who are you know need to be paid in cash and who um, are keeping their voices down when they go to restaurants and if they get in arguments with other people in a shop they walk out of the door and they don't stand up for themselves because you're constantly um, at risk of of being kicked out of the country those are all things that you kind of know but when you're hearing it from someone's lived and personal experience it certainly um, gives you a different picture and there is an invisibility to it because as you say often people need to be invisible because otherwise they're in danger. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Lani, you've talked about um, as a dreamer, you're you're yes. a dreamer, DACA recipient. That often the you know the dreamers are like these innocent children, and um, they deserve something better and different. And what does that imply about the parents? And how how do you feel about that description of DACA's as somehow the virtuous? Um, elements of yeah. the immigration community. I think I, I always sort of like look at that question and I think of my parents and you know a lot of people are like do you blame your parents for bringing you here and now you having to live day by day with this uncertainty about where you're gonna end up mm -hmm. and I I pause and I'm like if I was ever in the situation of my parents where you know you you're in Colombia and the government pretty much tells you that they can't guarantee your safety anymore what steps do you take um, and I probably would have taken similar steps that my parents did. Um, and there's many dreamers that have been here that, you know, have this sort of like American, American dream, similar to the ones that their parents had. Um, so, you know, I, I find it a little difficult to really just say, you know, blame the parents, the, the dreamers are, you know, kind of like these innocent individuals. Um, I mean, for myself personally, I, I didn't know that I was undocumented until I was, you know, late stage in high school. Um, when I was applying for FAFSA and I kept on telling my mom, hey, what should I be putting on this document? I know I'm not a citizen. Are we residents? I'm like, we've been here for a really long time. And I would like Google what resident meant and how long you had to be in the country for. And she would say, Liana, you can't fill out that form. 
Um, and I was like, well, Ma, like, don't you want us to get some sort of maybe financial help if possible? She would be like, Liana, you can't, you can't file that. Um, and then little by little, I started realizing the sort of situation that we were really in um, and, you know, that we were undocumented and that we weren't going to necessarily have, you know, these sort of like privileges that an American would normally have. It's amazing. I never thought about that, the moment where uh, an undocumented child yeah. has that awakening. Right. No, and, and for us, it was, you know, even slightly before high school, we would look at, you know, files that my mom and my dad would have of, you know, the evidence that they had submitted for the asylum case. So I would be like, Mom, you know, what happened to Grandpa a while back? You know, we're saying that he got kidnapped and all these things. And, you know, they would always sort of, like, try to shield us from that. They wanted to protect us so we didn't have to, like, day by day think about, you know, what could happen the following day. Um, Marie, can you talk a little bit about um, the immigration system as we experience it? I think Lee described it as the, in the interior of the country. So a lot of the focus of media coverage of immigration has, as you all know, been on the border. These sort of dramatic things, you know, the caravan and, and people trying to cross these incredibly inhospitable pieces of terrain. And all that is dramatic. We're, not, we're, we're actually not doing that reporting at the Marshall Project. We're reporting on what the system is like inside the country. What's happening in immigration courts? What are all the ways in which the infrastructure has really been overwhelmed by the scale, the size, the scope of cases, the, num the, the load? Is that what you see in your work? Yeah, definitely. So Lee mentioned in the video that there are 11 million undocumented people in the United States. The government also estimates itself that they believe they can deport, if they would like to, 3 million documented people in the United States. And those are the people that we see who are routinely picked up by ICE, often through this fingerprint sharing and kind of going through these government databases. Um, and what what our system looks like internally is that because immigration is still, as Donnell said, is not a criminal system, is not a court system, is not, we don't have what we would think of as, as judicial Article Three judges, right, independent judiciary. Um, the process that people go through when they're in immigration court and facing deportation, they are afforded very, very few rights. So, for example, people are served legal documents uh, that are only in English, right? Um, and they are not given free attorneys. And so if you can't read English, or your literacy level even in English is not wonderful enough that you're reading legal documents, which I think is a lot of people, right? A lot of native English speakers. Um, you don't understand necessarily even what you're being charged with, right? Um, and then, because there is no system of free attorneys, people go in front of an immigration judge and the judge says, okay, well, you need to go learn the immigration law and tell me if you think you're allowed to stay. And what we see is a lot of people say, well, of course I should be able to stay because I have a family, because I've been here, because that was one mistake and I've reformed my life, right? And the judges say, as you heard this immigration judge say, you need to fit within the fact pattern that is in the law. And if you don't know the law, you don't even know if you might fit in that fact pattern, right? And so we see a ballooning of cases where people um, are, are really unable to defend themselves, even if they may have good claims, let alone the fact that, you know, as Carol said, we, there, it's very difficult to even get to a place where you might have, there's a, there are very narrow pathways to actually getting status. And we've talked to a lot of immigration judges who are just, you know, smiting their foreheads in horror. Like they have caseloads that they are years and years behind in their case. They have unconscionable, completely unmanageable numbers of cases to hear. And, you know, what is supposed to be a, some kind of fair judicial hearing is something that's a matter of seconds. Or now sometimes be, been, being done en masse. Dozens of people at once having their their fates decided all together by a judge who just can't process more people than that. It's the system is not capacious enough to handle everything it's being asked to do. Um, Jenny, can you talk a little bit? You're a documentary filmmaker who's made many fantastic films that are the traditional 90-minute doc, and this is something else. Why this structure, and what does this structure allow you to do? It's a it's a funny kind of quote unquote film. This project started um, as a series that we did at the Marshall Project about the criminal justice system. Um, it was a um, kind of a Rashomon, a look of um, 
let's look at all the different perspectives of of people inside the system and talk very specifically and emotionally and empathetically about listen to their experience without having um, point and counterpoint or um, trying to have an expert come in and tell you how you know c context and what the future holds are all kinds of things you normally see in um, news programs or, or documentaries, but um, we wanted these to be really testimonials and, and in some ways depositions really about their personal experience so that it's, it's um, you may agree with it or you may not agree with it, but it, it allows somebody to be heard and also to, um, to share because these are five minutes, some, some of them are longer, seven minutes. And um, the point of them, they live on the Marshall Project's website, um, marshallproject.org, is that right? The, the marshallproject.org, <laughs> www, the Marshall, <laughs> the marshallproject.org. They <laughs> the whole series is called We Are Witnesses. There's a, a one series solely called We Are Witnesses. This one is called Becoming an American. There is going to be another one about the criminal justice system in Chicago. And these are all designed to share them, to watch them and share them online and to incorporate them into social media. And they're designed to be seen on your phone, on your laptop, on your iPad, whatever. Um, and um, be taken in doses and and really not every story is going to speak to every person, but the goal is to really find the ones that are in, of interest to you if you want to hear about um, being detained at JFK. You can watch all about it. Do you want to say a couple words about how you found people? How did you yeah. connect with the uh, yes, his family or with Lee Wong? Yeah, the so thing? many of, so the Marshall Project, um, I don't work there, I am, um, an independent filmmaker, but when I'm working on these projects, I do go there, and there it's a wealth of amazing reporters who have tons of great contacts and um, relationships with people all over the um, city, especially, but really all over the country, um, who are experts in these fields. So they sent us to people. You have to talk to this person who works at the Immigrant Defense project? Okay, <laughs> right, I'm getting all my <laughs> names wrong. Um, because she will be able to, you know, talk to you about um, how detention and prison work, or, you know, the similarities or the differences. And so that's where we start, and then we um, to call as many, you know, just like any reporter would do, you call as many people as you can, and you ask them who's, tell me a great story, and um, Liani's story, I believe um, we found through a local news clip. There was a local news station. Definitely had a lot of that you had a lot of that. And, and actually, somebody shared it with me, and we were like, oh my god, we have to talk to this family. So um, there's, you know, we, we would talk to as many people as we could who would put us in the right direction. And I, your organization certainly helped us there. Yeah, some of our characters actually came from you. I think one of the things that we're trying to achieve in these films is that there, there is no advocacy in them. The Marshall Project, we're journalists. We're not immigrant rights advocates. Um, and we, we are not trying to tell you what to think. You listen to those stories and you decide what you think. It's really, we're trying to give that to the viewer. Here's information and now you decide. So I think finding the right people to tell the right stories is, you could argue, a form of bias. We chose certain people and not others to give to you. But we have tried to show an array of different kinds of characters so that the viewer can make his or her own decision. Um, Marie, can you talk a little bit about, we had a good history lesson from our friend from the National Park Service. And I think Lee, Lee flicks at the idea that the immigration crisis in our country is actually not all Donald Trump's fault. Um, it begins somewhat earlier. And maybe you could just explain a little bit about how long and deep the situation we're in is. Yeah, and so I like to tell people like what we have right now is like a car going 
160 miles an hour down the road. It's being driven by this president, right? It's being driven into a world of xenophobia and racism. But that car was actually built, like the original parts for it were assembled back in 1996, as Lee talked about, where we had these two new immigration laws that were passed that greatly expanded um, the number of people who, or the, the groups of people who could be um, deported from the United States. It greatly reduced the ability for individuals who are here to ask to be able to stay, to even get a judge to, to look at that for them. Um, it created um, this system where um, people who, who come to the US and are not able to immediately get status are trapped. That if they leave the United States, it will somehow get even harder for them to even come back, right? So it creates disincentives for people to leave or for people to even try to get status because if you uh, shine a spotlight on yourself to the immigration authorities, you're likely to be um, kicked out of the country. Um, and so that started in 1996 with these, this set of laws that are the laws we are operating under currently, right? We have not changed our immigration laws. As much as Donald Trump, I think, would love to be able to change them to make them worse, he has not been able to. Um, and then what we saw was that after 9-11, there was this um, real concentration on data and trying to make sure that we could get to people through the data systems that exist, right? And so we have now the Department of Homeland Security, which was created in 2003 in reaction to 9-11, which has as one of its goals to get as much data from as many players as possible so that it can use that data to identify and deport what they say is every deportable non-citizen, right? That is their stated goal. Um, and so what we see that looking like in practice is that if you have an order of protection against you, that information can be accessed by immigration. If you have been um, fingerprinted and then your case was dismissed, that information can be accessed by immigration. If you are in a local jail in a place that is not New York City, right, it's not only that that information can be accessed, but immigration will say to your jail, hey, could you just hold that person for a few extra days to give us time to come get them, right? Um, that is the way that this system is its feeding off of our state and local governments, which have the most contact with us, right? You, besides paying your taxes, right, a few days ago, hopefully, <laughs> um, you don't have a ton of interaction with the federal government on a daily basis, right? But you do have a lot more interaction. People have a lot more interaction with their state courts, their state systems, their state agencies, right? And that is the way that the uh, current system is using uh, to, to kind of gather this data. So we, we say that they're kind of leeching off the states. And that's why you see as a reaction, right, states like New York, California, some of our other more blue leading states, um, talking about how they can protect themselves, talking about how, how can our state and local policies really protect us from this over-enforcement of the federal government. So one of the things we do at the Immigrant Defense Project is we advocate for state and local policies and laws that are meant to protect the immigrants who are in New York. And we have to say that there are still more people deported under Obama than have been deported under Trump. Yes, as of today, I mean, he, Obama deported a little bit over 2.6 million people um, in his first six years. So, um, but as of today, he, he's still winning that game, I guess. Um, we will see what happens. One of the stories that the Marshall Project has done that has had the, on the one hand, the greatest resonance, and it's been reprinted and cited in many different places, and yet has somehow failed to really be heard, is the link between crime and immigration. We looked at 200, the 200 biggest metropolitan areas in the United States. This was a huge amount of data. It took our chief data nerd many months to do this. <laughs> she worked very hard on it. Uh, 200 cities, the, the cities with the highest rates of immigration have lower crime rates. It's the opposite of what the national narrative is today. High immigration is not associated with higher crime. It's associated with lower crime, and we have proved it. And although that's been on 
Hassan Minaj or, you know, it's been, I mean, it's been picked up in many, many places and yet it has not sunk in. And one of the really difficult things about reporting on immigration is the political divide. Criminal justice is something that people of different political parties actually can kind of agree is messed up. <laughs> there, there's a, a fair amount of agreement across the, the political aisle. I, immigration, we find it very difficult for simple fact patterns, like the lack of connection between immigration and crime, to actually permeate um, across the political aisle. Um, so maybe that's a question of the audience. How do we change that? But I, and I do want to get to questions from the audience, but I, Leonie, I would just want to ask you one last one, which is, can you talk a little bit about what it's like to live with this level of uncertainty? I, I know that's a hard question. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but to not, not to know about not to know what's next. Not to know what's next yeah. for your mother and for yourselves. I think one of the really tough things is that when somebody is deported, uh, they're not allowed to come back to the U.S. for pretty much 10 years. Um, and for my sister and I being DACA, we're not allowed to leave the country um, until things get resolved with DACA or until we get a permanent status. Um, so that's something that, you know, we live every single day knowing that we're not necessarily sure when the next time we see our dad in person is going to be. Um, and with our mom, you know, it's, it's knowing that every single time that I get home, I'm not sure if we have mail um, from the circuit court giving us a decision um, of when we have to book or if we have to book a ticket for mom. Um, and I think that's it's something that we've always sort of had to live with. Uh, my parents have been paying lawyers since we pretty much got to this country, um, trying to resolve things. Um, and, you know, for f something that they always wanted to do, I think every immigrant um, that has a dream here in this country is to be able to maybe buy a home one day, right? And that's something that my parents have always wanted to do. Um, but there's always been that sort of uncertainty as to, you know, can you really put roots right now? Um, you know, where will we be in a couple of years or, you know, will we be in this country? Um, so that's sort of like the uncertainty that we live with right now. Um, I think for my sister and I, you know, we've been pretty fortunate to be able to go to school, um, to be able to work here now. Um, I know we've kind of like had friends that have been like, hey, let's, you know, do an international trip. And that's where we're like, wait, we can't necessarily do that just yet. Um, but there's there's a lot of uncertainty right now, I think. Um, you know, right now we're 23 years old and, you know, we hear stories about uh, parents that have been deported and maybe their 12-year-old that's a citizen has been left here in this country. Um, and that's something that kind of like breaks your heart and, and you're left wondering, you know, how we are as like individuals, as humans, where we want to be uh, in, in this sort of history of this country. Um, and that's something that, you know, when, my parent, when my dad was deported, um, we sort of paused for a minute and we said, you know, we have to get this story out um, because a lot of the times when you hear the news, you might hear negative stories about immigrants. And there's just like misperception about who we are, um, but we're so much more. Um, you know, we're individuals that have contributed to this community, individuals that have, that love this country. I mean, my sister and I have been pledging to this flag since we were in first grade. Um, so, yeah. So uh, we like to open it up to questions from any of you if you have them. And yes, and I think you have to talk into a mic if you have a question. But don't Anyone let that intimidate you. It's not that hard. <laughs> I had a question about when you decided to register as DACA, um, because I gather not everybody did and there was a risk because once you register, you're giving them the, all the information. And I wondered if you could talk about that. Yeah, for, for my sister and I, it was sort of like a matter of we had to do it because we wanted to work, we wanted to go to school. Um, but I understand that that was definitely something that a lot of people sort of feared. And it was, you know, at this point, you're getting your fingers fingerprinted. The government knows that you are here. Um, so that was, you know, that that's definitely something that a lot of people had been concerned about. Um, in regards to DACA itself, I know my sister and I, we've, we've had individuals that have come up to us and, you know, they've been undocumented and they didn't necessarily have much of an understanding of DACA. Um, and, you know, we're like, hey, this is how the program works. And a lot of people have qualified under it. A lot of people have not. So there are certain, like, restrictions as to who can, who could actually file for DACA and who can't. Um, but, yeah, I mean, like, like I said, it's, 
what, as soon as you sign that form, the government knows that you're here. Hi, um, that was a really amazing panel and the films were incredible. Um, I just wanted to ask a question, who do you think should see these films? And who would, if you could pick you know, a group of people or a set of kind of professionals, who would you want to see the messages of the films and what you want to take away from it? Because it seems like there's such a huge problem, like how do we go and fix this? So it's not just even Trump, it's actually been here for a long time. So yeah, interested. I want everybody to see the films. I mean, I feel like I, I it's, as I was saying, like, I, I think I very, I, I did not know very much about the process of immigration and what people go through here. Um, and before we even filmed, just learning, it was, it was mind blowing, like, wait, what? And then there's this process, and then there's that process. And then if you apply for this, you can't get that. And, and we have a, you know, a, a woman from Russia who was a lesbian and being persecuted in Russia and she came here and she applied for asylum and she got it and it took her 10 years but her case was one of the fast ones you know like it's it's um I feel like it's it's designed for people who are either here and want to stay here and can't but maybe can learn something there's people like um Marie who has a part of a whole institution that can help people, but then there's also, I mean, we have a border patrol agent who watched the films and he said, and he's very, very pro deportation and very, very pro um, ICE and um, was saying, you know, these are great and I wish you had more people like me in here, <laughs> but I mean, I feel like, you know, he watched them, he, he um, shared with us his, his experience at working at what it's like to be a border patrol agent and to have to deport people right away. I feel like it's really, if you're interested in seeing another perspective and learning um, how it all works, I think it's valuable. So, and primarily for my, I have children who are 11 and they, um, they are learning from this too. So I think younger people could benefit a lot too. Yeah, and I think just to add into that, I, I definitely agree. Everybody should be watching this, um, or you know, be able to hear some of these sort of like stories, um, because there's always a sort of like understanding. A lot of people say, you know, just get back in line, you know, get in line and wait for the whole process, but there's there isn't the understanding of how complex that process is, right? Of cases being denied, of then you know having to take it to this next court and having to wait a certain amount of time. Um, so I think each each case is very different. Um, I know like for, for example for my dad like my dad he had his mom who was a US citizen that itself was going to be a process and we were getting close to the process but my grandmother ultimately unfortunately passed away um, but like I said a lot of different cases a lot of different ways but um, I really just love what you guys have done here uh, just because it, it, it gives us sort of like that voice and it allows us to share our stories. I just wanted to Maybe you can, from the Immigrants' Rights Project, know about that. In terms of what we can do, there are neighborhood watch projects, specifically looking out for ICE, calling off hotlines to warn people that ICE is in the neighborhood. Um, I know there's one in Queens, there's one in Brooklyn, there are probably more. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how people can get involved in that sort of thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So. I think one of the best ways to get involved is through a group called the New Sanctuary Coalition. Um, and they do a lot of training for ordinary community members in all of the different ways that you might be able to use the skills that you have or learn skills from them that would actually um, get you right ground floor involved. And so some of the things they do are train people to accompany um, people who are going to check in the way that Liani's family had to check in. Because while they were all checking in as a family, there are a lot of people who are checking on by themselves. And because of whatever is the immigration status of their loved ones, their loved ones don't feel comfortable going into that building, right? And so um, the New Sanctuary Coalition has figured out a way to train people about what are the rights of the people who are checking in. And they've found that actually, when there's someone accompanying them, 
to those immigration check-ins, the ICE officers are more respectful, are more likely to actually explain processes, are more likely to um, not violate people's rights that, in the way that we've seen before. And so I think that's one of the, the best ways right now to get involved. They have other programs, but I, I have a soft spot for the accompaniment program. What is the answer? <laughs> you know, I mean, if anybody should know, you guys should know best, right? You guys know, look and know uh, better, probably better than anybody what's going on. I mean, it seems like a whole lot of problems, you know? But what, what do we do? Well, I, 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 I don't have the answer. I'm a journalist. But I do think that, um, you know, part, part of what we see as... Uh, one solution is to is really to tell stories, to humanize uh, immigration stories, and to try. Look, this is a broader problem in our society about how do we actually make facts matter. What is it? What does it mean to be labeled fake news? What does it mean to be untethered from some kind of factual reality? Um, and you know, people often say, how do you overcome? The appellation of fake news. You've been labeled that way. What do you? What, what can you do to fight that? And you know, I don't have a magic bullet for that, but I have to say that continuing to report factually, even in the face of those attacks, is very important. And not to stop putting. In the end, I believe the country has to run on policy based on facts. And I can't believe that we won't, in some way, return to the necessity of actual facts being the basis of policy. Now, but I don't mean to sound naive because, of course, we've had many decades of immigration policy that was based on other things. Um, I do think that the process of humanizing, and as you said, Liani, there's a lot of terrible things about said, said about immigrants as a class that can be belied by an individual story showing what a family is like. That's not an answer to your question. I'm not sure that anybody on the panel. Oh, Jenny has the answer. She has the answer. I don't have an answer at all. But I do feel like if you use the term immigrant to equal something to be afraid of, which is how this administration is using the word immigrant. It is it is a fear-based rhetoric, and it is about um, the other coming in to harm Americans, which is ridiculous because we're all immigrants in some way. Yeah, but we, yeah, we should know better. I mean, of course we should know better, but we don't, right? Because, yeah. I mean... We're all immigrants. Right. Any Native Americans here. <laughs> right. I guess I'm, I'm saying we live in such a divisive and such a dangerous moment of history where, um, where the incitement of fear is used as a platform for, for, for votes. It's, it's very obvious and it, it happened during 9-11 too. Like it, it's, so I guess the, the purpose of something like this or the purpose of reading journalism that is, is um, not propaganda is to understand exactly, um, well, not just the facts, but also to find something relatable inside of it. Find something that feels like you could be that person. And I think that's the goal here. Humanizing, yes, but also I could be Liani or I could be um, Lee who, you know, suddenly changes her career to work in this problem. I think that that's the whole um, goal, is to find a way to see yourself in this environment. That's not a solution, but I do think the fear is from not knowing enough, frankly. Thank you. Uh, well, I don't have the answer either, but uh, I think a part of it that we've been hinting around is to make the historical connection that, you know, 40% of Americans have an ancestor who came to Ellis Island, and, and the rest of the 60%, most of them ha also have immigrants in their family. And, and it's a pattern in U.S. history that the immigrants come in at the bottom, and they're the recipients of persecution, but then their children get better, and their grandchildren make it, and they forget how the grandparents were treated. So people forget 
how my Italian grandparents were, were vilified by a significant proportion of Americans. And so I think it helps to remind people that, hey, do you know how your great grandparents were treated? You know, that's the same way things that you're saying. Um, it doesn't work with everybody, but I, I think it's one way to make it relatable is to remind people of what their roots are and, and, and how their relatives were treated. I thank you so much for your work. I have a question. Um, those people that were arrested, uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, what they were arrested for? I mean, percentage-wise, I'm just curious. So the, you said because it's ICE or whatever, they get information? Because right. they were arrested, right? Right, that's a great question. So yes, we see you. actually that the highest proportion of those arrests are actually traffic offenses. Seriously. Um, so one of the things that's happening in New York State right now is there is a big debate over whether or not undocumented people should be able to get driver's licenses, right? And so, and currently people without immigration status cannot get a driver's license. And while we live in New York City and we have a, declining but still great subway system here. <laughs> um, you know, in a lot of parts of the state and even in a lot of parts of the city, um, public transportation is not a way that people are really able to live their lives. And so the way that a lot, a lot of those people are getting fingerprinted is because they are driving without driver's licenses so they can go about their daily lives, going to work, taking their kids to school, going grocery shopping. Though That's the, the highest, um, the, the most common way that we see people get fingerprinted because, you know, as we said, actually there are lots and lots of statistics that show that immigrants are not any more or likely to commit crimes and actually yes, they they're less, less likely less. because as, as, as we've talked about, they're very scared, right? And for good reason, right? Um, I will also just say that we alluded to the fact that the criminal justice system is discriminatory on its face for everybody, right? And so we do see that immigrants who are not white, black immigrants, brown immigrants, have a much higher um, interaction with these systems, right? And that replicates itself in the immigration system. So if you are a black immigrant, right, you are not only more likely to be arrested by the police, you are also then more likely, as a result, to be um, yeah, put into the immigration for, system. Just for the traffic violation? Just for the traffic violation. So th the way that immigration that works is that the, the fact of being in the United States is cause to deport you, right? If you don't have status, the fact of being here is cause to deport you, right? Um, I think it's worth thinking about, in addition, that when people are arrested, even if that arrest results in a conviction, right? Our criminal system then mets out its justice, right? So if I'm arrested and then I am convicted of an offense, I serve my time, I do probation, and for most people, that is going to be the end of the story. I walk around with a criminal record and I'm, you know, I'm on my path to rehabilitation. For immigrants, there is a second step of punishment. Right, that second step of punishment can sometimes mean that even minor offenses where I say, okay, great, yeah, I did, I jumped a turnstile, okay, yes. I jumped a turnstile. Jumping a turnstile is a crime of moral turpitude, right? So we are labeling people criminal immigrants or criminal aliens, as this administration would call them, because of any minor offense. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, and I think oh, just to sorry. add, I mean, I, I personally have like a friend who was trying to get into DACA, um, and when he was young, he ended up getting caught like spray painting, and just because of that, like his record is completely finalized. Like he can't go to school anymore, he can't be a part of DACA, um, all because of that one event that he did when he was 15, 16 years old. 
Okay, the moral of the evening is beware of moral turpitude. Right? It's really, it's out to get you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. And please, if you do, it's themarshallproject.org. So go on and you know share the films and send them around, and let's help other people see them because we think this is part of the path that you're talking about. Yeah. Those people still live not knowing whether or not it's going to work. They, I mean, if you, you spend your whole life not knowing. And I'd also say that one of the things we do is we deport out of our site the people it doesn't work for, right? So when I said 2.6 million people were deported in the first six years of the Obama administration, you just think for yourself, who are all the people I'm connected to who would be hurt if I disappeared from the United States, right? And multiply that by 2.6 million. I can't even fathom 2.6 million people. <laughs>